This is Malik Cook from the University of Colorado, and I'll be speaking about treatment of glaucoma in the setting of pregnancy and breastfeeding. I'll cover IOP lowering in the setting of pregnancy, best practices when breastfeeding. I'll briefly discuss glaucoma laser and surgery. This is more of a focus on topical glaucoma therapeutics. And then I'll finish off with some best practices and recommendations. Pregnancy in patients without glaucoma, generally what we see is slight IOP lowering. The decrease in IOP usually begins around 18 weeks post gestation. And it's usually a modest decrease in intraocular pressure of one to four millimeters of mercury. Pressure is back to baseline at around six weeks post delivery. The IOP decrease is due to an increase in aqueous humor outflow and not a decrease in aqueous humor production. There's mixed evidence that hormones, estrogen, progesterone are linked to this decrease in IOP, but pregnancy has been associated with a lowering of episcleral venous pressure, although the link uh, between IOP lowering pregnancy and EVP is, is not very strong. There's a possible link with corneal hydration and central corneal thickness, but studies are mixed. Lack of significant IOP fluctuations during routine vaginal delivery and a slight increase in IOP during fundal pressure stage of cesarean section, maybe three to four millimeters of mercury. However, both of these vaginal delivery or cesarean section, the pressure fluctuations that you might see is not enough for us to make any recommendations in non-glaucoma patients. Pregnancy in patients with glaucoma and general IOP decreases in pregnant women who suffer from glaucoma. The pressure decrease is around 24% usually occurs around 24 to 30 weeks of gestation. Anecdotal and small series reports that IOP might elevate in some, and there's some evidence that IOP elevation occurs later in pregnancy. In particular, patients who um, have a history of some glaucomas in their family, like JOAG, should increase um, surveillance. Uh, and there have been some case reports of worsening IOP control and visual field defects. So basically what my take home message is from, from all of these points is that patients who are pregnant and have glaucoma should be followed uh, Q1 to three months during pregnancy just to make sure that they're not losing pressure control and um, that um, there isn't a later elevation in pressure as has been seen in some of the um, smaller case series um, that have been reported. The IOP lowering options are essentially the same as what we discussed for any form of glaucoma, medications, laser, invasive procedures. I'll basically focus uh, the most on medications and just briefly touch on lasers and invasive procedures towards the end. We typically um, categorize medications when it comes to pregnancy as category A through X. Category A is deemed safe, category B deemed possibly safe. Category C, adverse events have been reported in animals, but not in human trials. Category D, definite risk, but possible benefits uh, with some deleterious effects reported in patients. And category X, definite risk that do not outweigh the benefits. As of 2015, there has been a new recommendation by the FDA um, to change the labeling. In fact, this is more than a recommendation. Um, the companies are mandated to put new labeling in place that um, speak to the potential risk for pregnant and lactating women. Uh, I would encourage you to go to this link on the bottom of this slide to learn more about that. But for the sake of discussion and to learn a little bit more about use, we're going to stick to the old category A through X uh, for the remainder of the slides on this topic. Beta blockers are considered category C, adverse events reported in animals. There was a single case of fetal bradycardia resolved post DC of timolol 0.5%. A larger study out of Taiwan in 189 patients showed no difference in low birth weight between the control and the um, treated patients. Teratogenicity studies in animals post oral dosing of timolol. And again, it's important to point out that this is 7,000 times the exposure of topical drops in humans, and you'll see that throughout the remaining slides that a lot of the dosing that we're speaking about is extremely high, much higher than what we see in our treated patients, but it did show a deleterious um, effect, uh, which should be noted when considering using beta blockers. The recommendations for systemic beta blockers avoid during the first trimester, use lowest possible dose and stop two to three days before delivery to avoid effects on uterine contractility and potentially fetal compromise. Systemic beta blockers are thought to be relatively safe in pregnancy, but can cause intrauterine growth retardation, low APGAR scores, fetal bradycardia, and hypoglycemia.
Oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are considered category C. Acetazolamide does pass the placenta and four limb anomalies have been reported in mice studies. One case of teratoma in a patient treated at 19 weeks gestation. One case of fetal renal tubular acidosis post treatment of mother before C-section. And the National Collaborative Perinatal Project reported no increase in fetal abnormalities. Large study, 1,024 patients exposed any time in pregnancy to acetazolamide. Topical con um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, category C, drosolamide in rabbits at 37 times the human dose caused fetal vertebral body malformations and decreased weight. Brinzolamide was shown to cross the placenta in rats and was toxic at 125 times the human dose causing fetal malformation. Next category is alpha adrenergic agents. Bromonidine is considered category B. It's deemed possibly safe. Fetal studies in animals have been um, done and um, show that bromonidine is safe. Studies using bromonidine given orally to rats at 375 times the human dose revealed no evidence of harm to the fetus. A dose of 19 times that of humans caused no teratogenesis in rabbits. Apriclonidine, on the other hand, is considered category C. It was embryocidal at 60 times the human dose. Prostaglandin analogs, the most common drug that we used as primary therapy, is category C. Prostaglandin stimulate uterine contractility. Animal studies have shown increased abortion and preterm delivery rates. There is limited data in patients, and it is considered oftentimes the second choice to beta blockers in, in countries where studies have uh, been done, in particular a study in the UK where physicians were asked what their primary therapy would be. It was beta blockers, what their second choice would be in the setting of pregnancy and glaucoma. Uh, it was a PGA. Bisalta may be classified as category D due to intravitreal dosing causing fetal toxicity in rabbits at only 0.28 times the clinical dose. So keep that in mind when considering Bisalta as a choice. Rurokinase inhibitors are category C. Uh, this includes Ropressa. That's the one drug in this category that's on the market. Of course, there's a combination drug as well, but uh, for the sake of um, single monotherapy here, Ropressa is the one to be considered. No human studies, 214-fold the human clinical dose in rabbits, uh, did not cause adverse events to the fetus. On the basis of the prior FDA classification, this would be considered C, but it could potentially be considered category B pending more human experience. Not a lot of information for meiotics. It is considered category C. Pilocarpine is not known to traverse membranes well, and little was shown to traverse the placenta in rats. Studies in the first four months of pregnancy were not associated with fetal defects, but again, not a lot of information on pilocarpine. For combination drugs, I'll simply say look at the teachings for the standalone drugs, in particular something like Ropressa. Uh, if you're considering Roclitan, you can look at the, the two components rather than just looking at the Rokinase inhibitor portion of it, but um, look at the individual components and then the teaching for each, and you can make a decision based on that. Recommendations involve the OB and decision making. Very easy decision for me. I don't see very many patients who have glaucoma and who are pregnant, so very easy decision to involve the OB doctor to make sure that we're not missing any of the subtleties. Consider the risk benefit of any treatment. Punctal occlusion, including punctal plugs, uh, is recommended. Actually, I, I, in the few patients that I've seen who are pregnant with glaucoma where I had topical therapy, I put punctal plugs in all of them to decrease the systemic absorption. Timolol is a good first-line option, particularly those with less systemic absorption like the gel form as well as the 0.25% formulation. Ramonidine is a good option in the first two trimesters, but avoid use later in pregnancy due to CNS depression. Oral CAIs might be best later in pregnancy after fetal limbs have formed but stop close to birth due to metabolic imbalances. And PGAs are considered less desirable, uh, but they have been shown to be successfully used with apparent safety. Breastfeeding and glaucoma therapy. General considerations, newborns have less ability to meta metabolize drugs and an immature blood-brain barrier. Drugs peak in the breast milk at around 30 to 120 minutes after topical installation, so keep that in mind uh, when um, counseling the patient on when to breastfeed. Consider topical treatment just after breastfeeding. Beta blockers are considered safe, but surveillance is still needed. The same thing with CAIs. 
alpha agonists um, avoid due to CNS risks, so don't take them in the uh, later stages of pregnancy. Uh, and of course, um, be careful during the breastfeeding process because the baby will get um, the um, effect through the breast milk. PGA is unknown, but likely safe due to shorter half-life of only 17 minutes. Rokinase inhibitors and myotics, really unknown at this point. Um, I think the take home from this is um, to educate, use the best class of medication possible for the uh, patient, uh, but then uh, take some time to discuss that the drug peaks in the breast milk at around 30 to 120 minutes, and uh, that installation of drops just after breastfeeding will give the lowest dose at the next breastfeeding round. These are the recommendations in table format. I won't spend time on this, but you can always um, stop the video here and just take a look and even do a screenshot here if it's helpful for you. Lasers and surgery, briefly, lasers are less effective in younger patients and contraindicated in many forms of glaucoma uh, that are prevalent in, in this patient population like inflammatory congenital and JOAG. It should be considered due to the safety and ability to avoid medications. Um, so many times you have very little to lose in these younger patients by doing laser to help decrease the dependence on medications. And again, we don't need the laser to work for an extended period of time uh, just to get the <clears throat> patient through um, the um, delivery. Surgery is used as a last resort. We don't have a lot of information when it comes to surgery in this setting. Very little information on MIGS procedures, and there's really not much more that I can say uh, with, with that topic. Younger patients will fail faster when it comes to filtration surgery because of hormone-driven wound healing. Um, avoid use of mitomycin C and 5-FU when doing filtration surgery because of the potential effect on the fetus. Topical anesthesia when possible to minimize the effect of systemic medications. And there are various um, different anesthetics here that are category B and C. And, and for that, I would say, uh, make sure you're working with an anesthesiologist who is familiar with this patient population and make the best choices for both the patient and the fetus. In summary, glaucoma medications are beneficial to lower IOP when needed in the setting of pregnancy with some options better than others. Encourage compliance with therapy and punctal occlusion with a punctal plug. Involve the patient's obstetrician in decision-making. Avoid aggressive IOP-lowering targets when not essential. And glaucoma surgery is relatively safe and should be discussed with the patient when class B medications and laser trabeculoplasty have failed to adequately control the pressure. Much of the teachings um, in this discussion have come from this practical guide to the pregnant and breastfeeding patient with glaucoma. I thought the authors did an excellent job at putting together this commentary, and I would encourage you to download this paper if possible and read it and keep it on hand for the rare circumstances when a patient comes in who has glaucoma and is pregnant. Thank you very much.